When PCI Express first emerged onto the market in 2004, it was heralded as not just the successor to the AGP slot PC gamers had known and loved. It was the all-encompassing solution to add-in cards for the computer, from home use to workstations and servers. It was scalable, it improved power delivery, increased throughput, and offered unfettered bi-directional bandwidth to all devices simultaneously. But, like all new standards, it had one major problem. If you bought a brand new GeForce 6800 Ultra or Radeon X800 XT Platinum Edition in 2004 on the AGP bus, chances are you intended to keep it for a couple years or more. After that, you'd have to change out your entire platform for a new graphics card, which may or may not have posed a massive inconvenience depending on the age of your system. That meant not just a new motherboard, but new RAM as well since DDR2 was soon a thing, and then likely a new CPU. It wasn't uncommon to upgrade a graphics card every couple years, but the rest of the system would typically be expected to last four or more years. A few motherboard manufacturers saw an opportunity in this dilemma and decided to offer an inexpensive solution. Instead of an all-new computer, what if you just migrate your existing CPU, RAM, and graphics card to a new motherboard which also had support for future graphics cards? The solution was a whole slew of transitional motherboards that supported both AGP and PCI Express, often using creative methods for doing so. Most chipsets at the time only supported one or the other, so unfortunately motherboard manufacturers would often resort to the old PCI bus, a standard dating back all the way to 1992 and limited to a shared 133 megabytes per second bandwidth speed to fake an AGP interface. They of course couldn't actually call these AGP, so they go under names like AGX, AGI, FGE, XGP, and AGP Express. Then they got some help from some chipset makers, the first of which was VIA. With the PT880 chipsets, LGA775 based platforms could finally have true AGP sitting alongside PCI Express using what they called the UGI or Universal Graphics Interface issuing directly from the Northbridge. The downside to this was that the PCI Express slot was limited to 4x functionality, lowering the usual 4 gigabytes per second bandwidth down to just 1, which was actually half the speed of even AGP 8x. In some cases, this didn't make much difference, but for future upgradability, this was a compromise. Then along came ALI. Founded in 1987 under the name ALI, or Acer Laboratories Incorporated as a subsidiary of Acer, this designer of integrated circuits had long provided chipsets for various platforms, as well as VGA cards and other add-in parts. While generally only a supplier of OEM and budget chipsets, they began to make a name for themselves in the late 90s with the Aladdin 5 chipset for SuperSocket 7. They'd remain a distant third or even fourth tier design house, however, right up until they spun off their business from Acer under the name UOLI, before being acquired by NVIDIA in 2003. One of the last chipsets they produced is in this motherboard that I'm reviewing today. This is the 939 Dual SATA 2 by ASRock. It utilizes the ULI M1695 chipset and is one of only a couple motherboards ever made to provide 100% full bandwidth 8x AGP and 16x PCI Express. It does this by pairing the PCIe equipped M1695 with another chipset M1567 which supports AGP. This sort of dual Northridge approach is possible thanks to a feature introduced with the Athlon 64 architecture called Hypertransport, which allows an extremely fast link between the CPU and other components. ULI uses Hypertransport to link the two chipsets, so even though the AGP slot is connected to a kind of Southridge configuration, as benchmarks showed, this allowed no loss of performance whatsoever. In fact, it was actually among the top performers according to an Antec, despite the motherboard being targeted to budget users. 
The board comes equipped with not just a 16x PCIe and 8x AGP slot, but also a utilitarian complement of three PCI slots and a single 1x PCIe. Then there's this mysterious yellow slot at the top, along with a huge bank of jumpers. It looks sort of like another AGP slot, but it's actually a proprietary slot designed by ASRock as part of their CPU upgrade feature. That's right. ASRock actually produced a specialized card that would fit into the slot just for socket AM2 CPUs, complete with its own power regulator circuitry and DDR2 slots, which were certainly cutting edge at the time. Unfortunately, the upgrade card did not support AM2 Plus CPUs like the Phenom series, so at best you were getting a slight clock speed boost over 939 CPUs. What's more, the setup made using a large heatsink impossible. It was a novel idea in premise anyway. The board came equipped with the latest SATA 2 standard as well for its time, courtesy of a J-Micron JMB360 controller connected internally by PCI Express. It also supported 8-channel audio, up to 8 USB 2.0 ports, while also offering a nod to the days of old, with a parallel port, a serial port, and PS2 connectors on the back. BIOS options are plentiful, with settings for your CPU base clock, PCIe clock, fairly in-depth memory settings, SATA RAID, but only on the first generation ports, and the usual settings for AGP cards, including an option for ensuring compatibility with non-native AGP cards that used bridge chips. Options for overclocking seem pretty decent at first, with a respectable number of RAM dividers and hypertransport multipliers. Then you look at voltage settings. The options for the CPU vCore include everything imaginable from 0.8 volts up to 1.4 volts. That's right, the board tops out at just 0.05 volts above stock. DRAM voltage only gives you a cryptic high, normal, or auto. The hardware monitoring tab doesn't tell you what your DRAM voltage is either, leaving you to guess what that all means. You'd think all that would add up to a terrible overclocker. You'd be wrong. Against all odds, the 939 Dual SATA 2 overclocks better than my old DFI NF4 Ultra D LAN party. The base clock went all the way up to 312 MHz. My OCC PC4000 RAM runs perfectly fine at 510 MHz. And get this, my Dual Core 4400 Plus gets to 2.8 GHz with only 1.4 volts, a full 100 MHz more than the DFI board managed. After changing out some leaky stock capacitors near the CPU socket, this board has been rock solid stable, and with an SSD, the whole platform is exceedingly snappy under Windows XP. Unfortunately, the one lone SATA 2 connector seems to perform terribly and doesn't garner much more transfer speed than regular SATA would. From the inside and out, this board is something truly unusual and unique. From its truly rare chipset configuration to its outstanding performance and unexpectedly good overclocking capabilities. It's also one of a kind for offering the full potential for both AGP and PCI Express graphics cards, and the convenience of having that on one motherboard is why I chose it for all of my retro GPU benchmarking. There's something really special about being able to swap out any card I want, or even run both types at the same time. Or three if I'm feeling ornery and want to try a PCI card too. It's made this platform possibly the most enjoyable hobby PC I own and it will remain a staple of my XP build for years to come. Thanks for watching. This has been Pixel Pipes.